Good evening, everybody. It's great to have our people here in person and then everybody online. And uh, last week, we had a great time of hearing from Pastor Messer as he was teaching on heaven. It got me excited because we're going to go revisit some of those same verses because we're going verse by verse through Revelation. And I can't wait because if some of us were to turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter like 21, you're going to come across stuff and think, wow, I don't know if I've ever heard this taught before, if I've ever read through this and, and explained it verse by verse. So we're going to do that. Um, and so we have our lesson tonight, which we're just picking up the second half of Revelation chapter 20. We're going to finish up this chapter tonight. Next week, just so everybody knows, uh, online and in person, there will be no services. We, uh, of course, uh, Thanksgiving Eve, I don't know if that's an official holiday, uh, but we recognize that. So there will not be any services or anything going online or in person uh, this coming uh, next Wednesday. So, but it's great to have everyone out. Uh, I, I know that a lot of times we publish this online and we have uh, people that grab them as they come in, the prayer list. Um, I can tell you there's a number of people that we should be praying for. Uh, obviously, the prayer list is full. Um, I got a message from Donna Higgins as we were getting ready to uh, start uh, the service tonight. And he, she was telling me that Vance Higgins is, has pneumonia. He's in Doctors West. And she was telling me that he is not doing well at all. Um, I don't know any more details than that. And be honest, because of COVID and her not being able to go up there and visit him in ICU, she doesn't have a lot of the details either. She just gets what she gets off the phone. Uh, but I know she's got a lot on her with that. I know there's a long list of other people in the same situation. Um, so I just challenge you really to take this prayer list and, and pray over these people. When you see them posted on Facebook, it goes a long way. And I know it ministers to their heart just knowing that there's people that have their back and that care for them in this way. So take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And uh, we're going to finish this up. I'll recap a little bit of uh, what we went through the week before last. <clears throat> and we started this series on eternity, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about eternity. And so we get through the tribulation period, and we get into this new part of this, and everything starts, you know, when we talk about she'll have everlasting life. We're getting into that everlasting life part. And so we started in Revelation chapter 20 with the study of the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ when he restores things back here on earth. And it's one of those things that we don't hear a lot of teaching about. It's not one of those things that we really talk about. Uh, but the Bible talks about the lion be with the lamb and the fact that the Satan is bound and he's not there deceiving and there's no more sin. There's none more uh, of the challenges that we have this. There's no more of the curse. And we have this new heaven, this new earth, this new life. It is beyond what we could imagine. And the Bible gives us some of the descriptions. We went back through the verses to look at it and, and how at the end of that period of time, the Bible says that Satan is loose for a season. The Bible doesn't say how long that is, and the ones that are born during the tribulation period, then they have the choice whether they're going to choose Christ or they're going to be deceived by Satan. That's the same way that it started with, and that's how it's going to end. At the end of that, we, grow, we roll into verse 11, and I would like to read verse 11 all the way through the end of the chapter, and then what we're going to do is we're going to back up and we're going to break every sentence down as we go through this, understand. Uh, along with this, I'm also going to revisit uh, one of the other judgments that is not me uh, mentioned here. But the reason why I want to do that is because people confuse the two all the time. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment are two different judgments for two different groups with two different purposes. And uh, I know that we've already touched on these things. So for a lot of people, you'd be like, you just did this. And I know that. And I, I can promise you that uh, this, this repetition of this will not hurt us. It's good to kind of get them uh, ingrained in our minds as we study this and stuff. So let's start in verse 11 and just soak it in as you're reading. If you're online, I hope you have your Bibles and you're watching this as well. And we'll go line by line and go through this. And what we're doing is we're just going to study what is going to happen at the end of time. And it says, And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. 
And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. We're getting into some deep stuff. And I think the best thing that we can do as we start this is just to pray. So let's pray together as we start this. God, I thank you for the word of God. And I thank you, Lord, for how you've given it to us to understand. And Lord, for us to understand what is coming. And Lord, we understand that a lot of these things we're going to read tonight, praise God, we do not have to deal with or face because of the fact is that we know you, we've been saved. And Lord, that we know that our sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, Lord, we will not stand in judgment or condemnation because we are your children and we are saved. But Lord, we also know that we're going to think of people that we love and care for that are not saved. Lord, for the reality that this is not just something scary in the Bible, this is the reality of our future. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help it to be something that educates our hearts and minds. But Lord, help it to be something that stirs us up as well. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that we can pray to you and we can have this relationship with you. And bless us as we read your word and give us understanding as we do so. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Two judgments. At the beginning of this, there's no question which one this is because it spells it out. The great white throne judgment. There's a second one that takes place and that happens at the time of the rapture and it's the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne judgment is for those that are um, lost. And the one that is the judgment seat of Christ is the one for those that are saved. So what is the difference? And I know that I'm going to kind of pause and rewind and go through this because of the fact is when we get into the wine, a lot of times we start associating them together. And I want to just make it very clear what is the difference between them. So we're going to review the judgment seat of Christ for those that are saved before the saved. Uh, when we go back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, we believe that's where we're finding it in the timeline of Revelation. But a lot of the description as we get of the judgments, we find in other parts of Scripture. And we read these all the time, and you'd be amazed at how much the Bible talks about the judgments. You'd be amazed at how many verses, you know, when we say verses like, in, at, at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, that's talking about the judgment. So we begin to take through the Bible at all these things and we begin to form the doctrines. So as we go through Revelation chapter 20, we're going to take all those verses and pull them in because it kind of makes the puzzle come together as we're doing this. So several things about the, uh, this judgment we're talking about for the saved that happens earlier. The Bible says that it happens in the air. The Bible says the first thing that we see is the throne. The Bible says in Revelation 4, 2, that immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. So we've got this picture that happens. This will not be a judgment of condemnation. And the reason why I reiterate this is because I hear Christians a lot of times making this uh, some statements. So it might be one of these things that right now I'm going to be like, whoa, I would never heard it that way or I don't understand that because I've heard some things that I've never studied. There is a thing about being Christians that sometimes somebody will say something down the road and they pass it on and pass it on and it's repeated so much that we really don't know where it's found in the Bible. We just know we've heard it so much that it has to be in the Bible. I, I challenge with anything that you believe or you've heard, find it in the Bible. Find out where the Bible says about it. Don't just take it for, you know, for the fact that oh, I, I grew up hearing this. I love the fact that I grew up in church, but I tell you, the Bible says that we are to rightly divide the word of truth for ourselves, to know it, to stand on it. So the judgment seat of Christ for the saved is not of condemnation. Let me explain. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, say unto you, that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's the eternity part that we're talking about. And shall not come into condemnation. You cannot come into condemnation. You say, why is that? Now, I'm going to sound like a broken record because you could go back to the last study that we did on Revelation. We got to these things to explain it. You are saved if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Your sins are forgiven. So the question is, what would you stand in condemnation for if you were to stand before God? Because when he sees you, he sees you as a child of God that's for forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is what he sees. So you cannot stand in condemnation because 
Remember, your sin is where? As far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered no more. So when you see the blood, according to even the illustration of the Old Testament of the Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You, you are saved, sanctified, you, you, are, you are preserved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, I could preach and teach on this all day. I won't do it because we've already done it. But just have that in mind. But it will be a judgment of rewards. So when you have people say something like this, and they come up to you and say, be careful, you're going to stand before God for that. Just understand that when we stand before God as, as Christians, we're standing in there as a reward, not as condemnation. By the way, if you did stand in condemnation and you were judged and said, sinner, or you did this, or you fell short, then what? He doesn't let you into heaven? I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, what would follow after that? Because the thing is, when you stand unforgiven before Jesus Christ, that's what he sees. So um, it will be a judgment of rewards. Because God has entrusted us with his business. And you say, okay, explain that. Now we're going to get into the great white throne judgment. And that's what the majority of this is going to be about. But let me just touch this. When Jesus was teaching about the parable of the talents, he was teaching about the bema seat, which is another word for the judge, uh, judgment seat of Christ. And I'll explain that here in a minute. So here's the verse that actually Jesus is talking about. It, and he illustrates this. It says in Matthew 25, verse 13, he says, Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour where, wherein the Son of Man cometh. For the kingdom of heaven, okay, we know what we're talking about, is a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servant and delivered unto him his goods. And to every one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and every man according to his uh, several ability, and straightway took his journey. So what is the point of this story? It's the fact that God... As, as the one that owns and, and directs everything, left his servants behind and gave them responsibility. And when he came back, he held them accountable for what they did with what they were given according uh, to their stewardship. And we talk about this with our time, our talents, and our treasures. What you do with your talents and abilities of serving God and investing in it. One that had five invested in had ten and, and, and vice versa and it went down. But one of them took it, buried it, and did nothing with it. And the Bible is just talking about what are we doing with what we have uh, that God has given us. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it goes along with this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to which he had done, whether it be good or bad. So the judgment seat here comes from the Greek word bima, which is a place where the Olympic winners would stand to receive their awards after running a race or after winning a race. It was, an, it was recognizing their accomplishments. That's why the Bible says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we see that, the rewards. And by the way, they are also tested. Another thing that we've probably grown up hearing, but in understanding how that applied to this. So what are you being rewarded for, for what you did? How does that apply to this situation? And it says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, every man's work shall be made manifest, shall be known, unveiled. For that they shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's works of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So the idea is we've done all these things. But remember, there are some things that we've done for the glory of man. We did it for the applause of man. We did it because out of guilt or responsibility. But God's talking about doing those things because we love him. Out, out of passion and love for God. The Bible even mentions that with the Pharisees. You know how it says in there, and he says, they pray openly that they might have their reward. Well, their reward's here on earth. They did what they did to be acknowledged by people, not by God. But he talked about this. Our, our works will be thrown in a fire, in a sense. It's, it's symbolic. It's representing this. What comes out is the gold, those things that were pure or, or from the pure heart that was done. And those things are the things that we get rewards from. And so in Matthew 6, 16, when he was talking about the hypocrites and talking about what they did, about disfiguring their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast, but verily I say to you, they have their reward. So it matters. We talk about standing before God and we get in the rewards, but let me remind you what we do with our rewards. And, I, and again, then we talk about it. It's one of my favorite groups is Casting Crowns. Casting crowns, the whole idea, the premise of the title of their group is the fact that we do what we do for the glory of God and we cast those crowns before the throne, before the feet of Jesus. That's what motivates us is, is thinking, it's not for me. He must increase, I must de decrease. I do what I do for the glory of God. 
So the Bible says in Romans, uh, Revelation 4, 4, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. What do we do with that? Verse 10, and the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created so that is that judgment we serve God we invest what we do we stand before God it's not in condemnation because we're children of God we're rewarded for the things that we've done those things are judged we're rewarded for those things. We have the crowns in, re in return because we love them. We cast our crowns before the feet of Jesus and that, that is that judgment. And it's awesome because of the fact is we should not fear going to heaven. You know what I'm saying? It's like if, if I knew I was going to stand in judgment, we wouldn't look and anticipate the coming of Christ. But at the same time, we don't want to be ashamed. I, I, I mean, I've been given so much, and the thing is, I want to be able to stand there knowing that I invested all that he did for the glory of God, and I made it, oh, I, I invested it to, to the fact that I didn't waste it. Don't waste your life. That's the good one. Let's get real with the other one. This is at the end of the millennial reign. This is at the end of the tribulation period. This is at the end of time. I mean, this is, this is the beginning of forever. It's this. And I hope that as we teach through this, that it really hits your heart as we read this. So it says in Revelation 20, verse 11, and it says, And I saw a great white throne. Paint the picture of this. The lost standing before God. And it paints the picture before it pulls in the lost to stand before God. But you can imagine this, this image. And, and I, I hope I, I'm praying and asking God to help me help this come alive to you guys as we do this. There's this great white throne, great. Is, there's, there, there's nothing greater than this. You can imagine on this kingdom of this earth that we have rulers and empires and we have royalty and we have authority and presidents and kings of the past and we could go on and on of all this. But the Bible is emphasizing that at this judgment, there is no greater than this. There is no higher, there is no greater authority. That's why the Bible says every knee shall bow. Every king, every ruler, every person that's ever had money or authority on this earth will bow. This great white throne. The throne represents authority. It represents kingdom. It, it, it represents that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. But in the, between those, it has the emphasis of the white. The white is always in scripture is symbolic of purity. It's, it's a symbolic of righteousness. It's, it's symbolic for the fact that uh, this is, there, there will be no bias. There will be no mistrial. There, there's going to be no lying. There's going to be no manipulation at this trial whatsoever. Not at all. No one will say at this trial that this is unfair. No one will say that they are right because they know that they will be wrong. Because they're standing in the presence of righteousness. Satan will not deceive them. Their minds will be clear. There will be no deception. It's, it's painting this picture. There is a great authority that's standing before them, and it will be of righteousness. And it says, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. There's Jesus that sits on it. Now, I, I don't know if we fully understand. There is the Trinity. There's the triune God. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we often say that we're going to stand before God, and we will stand before God. The Bible even says we stand before God. But in the one that is the judge is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in John 5, 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto his Son. So that verse alone just clarifies it from the very beginning. We stand before the one that paid the price. We stand before the one that died for our sins, the one that has the nail scarred in his hands as he's standing there. It says in verse 27 of John 5, it says, And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. He is the Son of Man. The lost will stand before the one that came to save them. The lost will stand before the one that came to die for them. It's symbolic. I didn't just create you. I came to redeem you came to change the sin. The one that knew no sin became sin for us. You want to know who you're, the, the, the lost are bound before? It's the one that came to rescue. And we sit there and say, I don't believe a loving God 
can do that. A loving God is John 3, 16, that gave his only begotten son to die on a brutal cross to save us from this judgment. It, I will never apologize for preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. I will never apologize for lifting up the cross at Easter. I will never apologize for preaching that there is a judgment because of the fact is that we have a loving God. And the, the, the truth of this matter of what we're portraying with this is the fact that, and I say this a lot of times, today he will be your savior, but one day he will be your judge. And that is a choice that we face in life. Romans 14, 11 reiterates this. It says, for it is written, as I live, say of the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. They will confess to God, they will bow before Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and the things of heaven, the things of earth, and the things under the earth, that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord into the glory of God, of the Father. They will bow to Jesus and confess to God. And I can tell you this, there will not be one atheist on this day. No atheist on this day. And the reason that Jesus is reiterating the fact that they will bow before that. They will confess that there is a creator. They will confess that Jesus is Lord. They will confess all these things. At the name of Jesus, they will do these things. And the next part is this grandeur of Jesus Christ. Because there is nothing like our God. I didn't fully understand this part until I started digging it out and, and researching it. And it's, so we, we, we see his creation in wonder. Okay, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures, okay, as I go through this. And I, I want your minds to go crazy with the fact of when, when we talk about God showing his glory. And, and we see the glory of God and we see it all around us. You cannot see a sunset. You cannot see the snowfall. You cannot see the rain. You cannot see the beauty of the mountains. You cannot, you cannot look and stare up at the stars, the stars, and you can't see the Milky Way and, and, and see the, 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 the lights of, uh, of the stars illuminate like, 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 a, like a show that man could never even dream of putting on. You, you can't stand in an ocean and, and look beyond the horizon and let your mind just go crazy of how far that goes. And then sit there and say that there is no God. You talk about deception. You talk about lies of Satan to sit there and say that there is no God. But let me tell you, everything that we see on this world that, that just puts us in awe of the beauty of God's creation, the, the, the magnitude of how amazing God is when you stare at the sun and you look at the earth and know if it came any closer, we would, we, we would fry. And if it was any further whatsoever we would freeze and the fact that everything works in perfect unison and to sit there and say there is no God at the heart of every person that says something like that is pride because you're unwilling to open your eyes and acknowledge that all of that came from a creator and everything works in perfect unison from the seasons to the sun to the waves to everything everything works in perfect unison and to sit there and say I don't believe there is a God I don't think we could fully even wrap our minds around all the beauty of this earth. But let me tell you, even Psalms 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. For man to walk outside, even somebody that lives in a tribe or somebody that lives here in America, and you look up at the stars, and you look up at the heavens, and the Bible says literally, that is the masterpiece. The heavens declare that there is a God. There is something greater than you. And to say that we came from a big bang, to say that we came from cosmic goo, to say that it randomly happened, is to have, you'd have to have more faith in that than you would in an actual God. So what does that have to do with this? Everything. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whom face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. If you go into a room and you see shadows of things, and you turn on a light, all the shadows disappear because there's something that showed up greater than the power of those shadows. Do you understand on this day, the one that we will stand before, it says, we shall see his face. 
And God was literally saying, you think there's beauty and power and majesty as you see the heaven and the moon and the stars and the waves and the oceans and the jungles and the, and the deserts and everything else. And you sit there and say, wow, how amazing was that? God says, when I show the glory of Jesus Christ, when you stand before that throne, it literally says that everything else has to run away. There is no place for them. It literally goes to the shadows of this whose face, the earth, and the heavens fled away. It's symbolic of the power of God. It's, it's symbolic of the majesty of God. It's symbolic of the presence of God. And we sit there and say, you know, show me your glory. You look in the Bible when it talks about the glory of God. We couldn't handle it. And, and, and in this moment right here, it's this, they step in the presence of the great I am. They step in the presence of the great majesty and I've thought for, for, uh, for uh, as they leave this and they go into hell, they'll never forget this moment. That out of all the beauty of everything that they've ever experienced here on the earth, and out of the beauty of everything they've seen in family and in, in nature, nothing compares to the original. And I'm not saying this to discredit God's creation or whatever, but compared to the author, the one that made it, everything is a cheap imitation of the glory of God because the heavens just declare the glory of God. But to see the glory of God, nothing can stand in the presence of the great I am. It says there was no place found for them. Nothing can compare to it. Nothing. What is this judgment? Believers are already there. I'll, I'll, I'll prove this to you at the end of this when we do this. Believers are already there, but not in condemnation. But it says, and I saw the dead, the small and the great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And it says, both small and great will stand before the face of God. It says that because there will be rich and poor. There will be the ones that own the private islands that had everything figured out. There will be every race, every color, every religion, every background. There will be religious leaders. And the Bible just wraps that all up and says the small and the great stand before God. The Bible explains this in Colossians 3.25 as it says... And he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. When we say that there is no respect of persons, that literally means that God plays no favorites. It doesn't matter if you grew up your whole life in church. It doesn't matter if you gave and did, and we spoke about that when we talk about Nicodemus. There is none. The body ex Bible explains, and I can't fully explain this. There's some of these things that are just a mystery. But the Bible starts talking about the body being reunited with the soul. As they stand before you, and, and, and just so you read it, just so you can get it for yourself, verse 13 again, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. The sea gave up the dead, and then death and hell. And I didn't fully understand this, and I challenge you, even if some of these things that I do, and you go, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that, but it's talking about for the, the, dead, the, the dead or the bodies from all over, and I'm not sure if I fully even understand it. I'm just telling you what I read and what I've studied. Of the sea gave up the dead. Of anybody that died in the sea, then the graves gave up the dead, and that's what it's talking about, death. And then hell gave up the dead. It's literally like every mankind from all history, anybody that's died anywhere, all coming before God in this moment. And so some have said that the sea is referencing hell and things like that. Most people reiterate it's just the fact that God calls everybody that's died in every place on the earth. There is no hiding. There is no getting out of it whatsoever. And then, then we come to the question of this. And I'm, I'm going to just throw this out at you because we're going to study this when we get to the next uh, part of this. And I'll, I'll show you where we're going to end with this at the end of this uh, lesson today. Are there degrees of punishment in hell? Are there degrees of punishment in hell? And I, I'd be willing, I'm not going to do this. Uh, even if you're watching online, if you want to comment, that's cool. But I wonder how many people would say, uh, hell is hell, that's bad enough. 
where people would say, I believe that there are degrees of hell. I, you know, it's for that. We're going to dive into this. But it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. So just l l reiterate, because I've had some people make it, say, at this judgment that there's going to be like separation, like good and the bad, and, you know, trying to do that. But let me just explain to you, where did these people come from? Death and hell, <laughs> okay? So if they came out of hell, they're not standing there to figure out if they're going back to the lake of fire. It's not a judgment like that, okay? They're already guilty, or they wouldn't have been hell to begin with. So it's not a matter of that. But they were talked, and it says in that thing that they were judged every man according to their works. So it's not a matter of judging them according to the works to see if they were good enough to go into heaven. That's not what it's talking about. But it does say that. So John 19, 11, let me just throw some things out there, make you think before we get into the next lesson. And Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power over all against me, except where it was given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee have the greater sin. Matthew eleven twenty four. 24, but I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. There's different passages, and I'm only throwing this out there to tease your mind because I'd love you to walk out of here going, are there degrees of hell? I'm going to go find out. I love that. Go find out. And then when we come back for our next lesson, we're going to dig into it and answer that question. But the way that we're going to answer the question is we're just going to start laying out the verses and what these things mean when we get into the lake of fire. We'll explain that. So the Bible now reiterates and explains that there will be books open now. So what are the books? What are contained in the books? Because it's not just one book. And it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the God, and the books, plural, are opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So why is God doing all this? And I, the best way to, I could illustrate, and I think we would appreciate even the thought of this, is we serve a righteous, fair just God. I'll, I'll say it like this. Nobody will go to hell and wonder why they're there. No one will go to hell and say this is unfair. No one will be in hell and say, how did I get here? And, 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 and the, the torments of hell and be like, oh man, I thought I did this and I don't understand. It won't be like that. So let's explain. Let's go through the books and break down what the Bible says about these books. Number one, it's the obvious one in this passage because it says the book of life. This book contains the names of all the people that are saved. And it says whoever was not found in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if we were to go into the doctrine of what the Bible says about salvation, we know the verse that we use often is for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So... We are, and here another verse, and you hath he quickened who were dead in your trespasses and your sins. So the Bible talks about us being spiritually dead, okay, being spiritually dead. Before Jesus Christ, I've, I've talked about what can you do to save yourself, okay? You sit there and talk about it. It's, it's the Spirit of God that awakens us. That's what we talk about conviction. The faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We talk about how powerful it is. We talked about this on Sunday with Lazarus, how the word of God was spoken. And we talk about how that's even true today. And the Bible talks about how he quickened or made us alive. If I was to go into testifying saying, how did you get saved? I promise you, I don't know all of your story, but I know aspects of your story. Somebody told you the word of God. Somebody gave you the truth. And that truth struck to your heart because the Bible says that it strikes, it, it's, it's like a two-edged sword piercing to the dividing of sunder, soul, and spirit. It gets to you in a way that it can. So the Bible talks about this. And then when we get to the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What did the gift of God do? It gave us life. Why did we need life? Because we were dead. What makes us alive? The Spirit of God. So even then, tie it into what we studied two weeks ago on Sunday morning. Jesus went up to Nicodemus, and what did he say? You must be born again. You have to be born again. What does born again do? It gives you life. It's talking about new life in Jesus Christ. What is baptism? Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. So the, the, the Lamb's book of life is those that have been born again. Those that were dead 
and were saved or brought to life or breathed into them or came into acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and they came alive through Jesus Christ. They were born again or given life, the Spirit of God. And so when we read that, it's very clear what it's talking about. It is life. The Bible says in this, reiterating the same point, John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. The one book that makes all the difference in heaven is the Lamb's book of life. And I'm not downplaying the other ones, but I'll explain here in a minute. Before hell, the last book mentioned is this book again. So we see this. In other words, the book of life will be held against the unsaved. It will be what shows that they were born at some point into the family of God. And I bring this out, and I, and I said this before, about once your name is in the Lamb's book of life, your name is in the Lamb's book of life. God does not have an eraser. And, and, and no, this is a doctrine that a lot of people might not understand. But let me just throw some things out there when you're talking about this. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 23, which I also preached two weeks ago. And then while I profess to them, I never knew you, depart from me that work iniquity. Now I dropped this in when I was preaching and I was talking about God does not have a, a short-term memory problem. He didn't say, oh, I never knew you. Like I, I, I forgot about that. He said, I never knew you. you. You didn't get saved and then lose it. And let me just iterate, if anybody struggles with the idea of, can I lose my salvation? Jesus went up to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Nicodemus comes back and says, do I need to enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born? He says, no, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. You must be born again. How many times were you born physically? So how many times can you be born spiritually? Now, I'm not, I'm not just trying to make that up. That is Jesus' illustration at the very foundational doctrines of salvation. John chapter 3. That's where we have John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It's one of the main verses that we use for salvation. Go back a little bit. What do you get? The foundation. You're born once. Now, if you have questions about that and say, yeah, but I could, I'd love, I love this discussion. And to be honest, we might actually in future studies on Wednesday night, because that's what we do in this, we do expository studies, that might be a great thing to break down that doctrine of that. But I will tell you, and there, you're, you're, those that are saved have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They open it up. If your name's not there, it doesn't matter. Number two, book number two is the Bible. God will show us simply uh, the plan of salvation and what was set before us. The Bible says in Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And there's a lot of other things that reiterate the fact of the books that were there. It's a forever book, and the Bible talks about Revelation, the last verse, last chapters, about the book and the Bible, the authority, the ultimate authority of our lives. And so there's a number of verses that point to that as well. But then also the book of deeds. Now, we know that just because of the fact is that the Bible reiterates this actually in the description of this. Verse 12 again. And I saw the dead, small and great, same before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written according to their wor works. So another way of putting this is the book of remembrance. Now, I have speculation of some of these things. Um, you take all three books. And, and, I'm, and, and some of these things, I just try to put the pieces together as I read this, and I, I'm not trying to teach my own doctrine or whatever. The book of life. Your name is not in the book of life. But Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name, and thy name done many wonderful works, and cast out devils? Now, honestly, nobody's going to speak in the presence of God, but he gives us Matthew chapter 7 is reiterating the thoughts and heart, of the, the thoughts of minds, uh, the mind and intents of the heart of being able to see into their mind of what's going on in that in that spot but the fact is they're sitting there with the idea that lord have i not done all these things have i not done good it doesn't make sense why is my name not written in the book of life the bible and then we got the scripture and the plan of salvation and what jesus christ came to do and then the book of deeds almost a book of remembrance and i don't know what this is going to be but it says according to their deeds the deeds are the things that you've done and, and going back, and, and, and once again, I'm just trying to put the pieces together, the different things that I've said 
of could it be that at that moment saying your name's not in the book of life but I can tell you you went to church you heard it over and over again I brought your conviction and God's going through almost like this was your life I, I'm not sure but I do know that these things are mentioned in the Bible and I know nobody's going to walk out of there with the idea of how did I miss it he's a righteous judge and by the way he loves us and be able to say this is what I've done for you this is what I've given you and this is where you rejected it Depart from me, for I never knew you. The Bible says in Romans 2.16 that ties into this, In that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Another way that we know that it's probably one of the books is the Bible. Because he, he says that. But he says that God shall judge the secrets of men. And I think even in that, of, of tying that in, for people to say and say, Wait a minute, I've never gone to jail. I didn't do drugs, I didn't, I didn't steal, I, you know what I'm saying, all these things. And God even peels back the hearts of them and says, you had greed, you had lust, you had anger, you, 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 you held in resentment, all these other things. And God says, I'll even judge the hearts, the part of man that people can't even see. All of these things. And it reiterates in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what the three books are? You came short of the glory of God. Talk about standing on trial. It won't be to determine, it's to explain. Because the first book, the Lamb's Book of Life, you, were, you never accepted Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm going to read this again, not because I think it's so powerful. And... I want us just to see this because it is a glimpse into this day. I read this a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, but I'm going to read it again. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, that is the gospel. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. And then when I profess to them, I never knew you, depart from me, that ye that work iniquity. I, I, and I, I said this, I'm not re trying to re-preach my message, but the fact of how good Satan is of deception. Many will stand before me saying, I've proclaimed your name. Many will say, I've done a lot of stuff. Many will say on that day, have I not given, served, attended, whatever, because they relied on all those things. But John 14, verse 6 is so clear that there's only one way. And, and I think if you ever have that in your mind, that I, I think I'll go to heaven, or I hope so, or man, I don't know how I win it, I've tried so hard. If it's anything about you, then it's not right. Because it's all about what he did, not about what we've done. And then we get to the end. And it's the lake of fire. In Revelation 2.15, there's the word that's cast. We'll read it in a minute. It's a word that means to throw out. Like you hurl a rock or a ball. The unsaved will literally be cast into hell. Hebrews 10.31 says this. And this, these are verses that we don't... Man, we talk about the loving father and the prodigal son and running back to him, the mercy and grace and... You know what I'm saying? Everything that we describe, the unconditional agape love of Jesus Christ. But there is the other side. He would not be God if he was unjust. He would not be God if he ignored sin. He would not be God if he swept it under the carpet. He, he, that, that's what makes him the righteous judge, the righteous king that he is. And in Hebrews 10.31 it says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It, we should preach hell in such a way that people get it now. And not driving people of fear, but the reality of what is to come. And by the way, I'll say that a lot of this when we get into the last part, which is the lake of fire, it was never created for us. It, the Bible very clearly says it was created for Satan and the angels. It was created for sin. And we'll explain that when we get there. And the Bible says in verse 14 of Revelation 20, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. We talk about 
being born again in, in, in the, our, the second resurrection. Try this one. This is talking about the second death. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. And then it starts over. And this is the second death. I've thought about this. Have you ever thought just, I mean, you read through these things and then you kind of just pause and you just let it get in your heart and mind. I start my messages that I preach on Sunday, usually Sunday afternoon, Monday. I mean, as for like writing that actual one, not counting like reading and stuff like that beforehand. And it's amazing the more that I read and I study and I put things down, how God works in my heart and mind as I get closer and closer to that. Because it is a living book and God speaks to our hearts and minds. But can I just tell you something that the Lord laid on my heart as I'm thinking about this? Is the fact that the, the Bible says that hell gave them up and they stand before God. And for that moment of thinking of regret, of thinking, how did I get here? You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the Bible says they, they, the, the death and hell gave them up. And then they stand before God. And they're not just standing somewhere. This isn't just like an epic church service. The Bible says they stand before the one that, that heaven and earth flee from because of the presence of the glory of God. In that moment, have you ever done something and you think, man, why did I do that? Man, what? If I could go back, it's just that second or that moment or... You know what I'm saying? When you've been in a car accident and you thought, oh, I can make it, you know, and you, you, you gun it and try to go out. And then you, you're just thinking, why did I do that? And to stand before God and to be pulled out of that, in that moment, to have your life or your deeds flash before you and, and be like, how did I not see the glory of God? And, and I think in, in Jude, if you study that, and it talks about, Talk, it just some having compassion, making a difference. And then it talks about saving them out of the fire. I think it's Jude 22 and 23. And I just think, guys, right now, we have the opportunity to talk and to tell and to share. I was talking to somebody right before the service. I don't want to go back to the days before COVID. I don't want to go back to being so busy talking about people needing Jesus that I'm not busy reaching people for Jesus. And, and I, I just, the time is short. And, and I, I feel like through all of this stuff is crazy. And I know we joke about 2020 and it's so bizarre and what's next or whatever. To me, it's almost like in a football game when you hear the two-minute warning. And then you go out to the game and you play a different thing you did before. And why is that? Because we don't know how much time we have left. But I tell you, the Bible is filled with warning, 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 warning. So that you know the time is near. So that you know the time is near. And when the time does come to a close, there is no second chances. There is no going back. And I'm not trying to... And some people lay me right now as like the preacher of doom and gloom. I'm trying to be the opposite. Because right now we have life and hope and the gospel in time we sit there and say, well, America's changing. Yeah, America is changing, but the gospel doesn't. And as long as I can open my mouth and sit in here and talk on those screens and be able to do what I'm doing, we should go all out with it. Because this is coming. And it should fire us up. God does away with something. The Bible says in verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now, I want to explain something to you with this. This is terrible in this passage, but amazing for us. Terrible and utterly amazing. Because the Bible says in Romans 5, 12, but as one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Death, sin, death, sin. The wages of sin is death. There was this thing that is terrible that has haunted us that we that is that has been the worst part of life is death funerals saying goodbye dealing with cancer all these other things death 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 and the bible described that there would be no more sin and no more death in there because literally at that point god literally hurls death hurls the the curse into hell 
And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? It's death. That's why in, Roman, or in Revelation 21, he says, there will be no more death, neither crying, for the former things are passed away. You say, why is that? Because Jesus deals with it at that moment. And at the, at the judgment of Christ, at the great white throne judgment, God says, no more curse. And he takes that curse of hell and he casts it into the lake of fire, literally judges the curse of sin, and it is gone. Gone. So when the Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, it is more than just the loved ones that hung on to their scent. It is the fact that God did away with the curse. And in verse 15, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, and there it is, it all comes down to where he goes through the books, and he says, I did this for you, there's the gospel. You had so many opportunities, and I told you, and I, I put it on Facebook Live, and I preached to you, and I did all these things, the book of deeds. But he points back to the one book, and he says, whoever was not found here, you, you never were born again. You were never in the book of life. And he says in that passage, they were, they were cast into the lake of fire. Removed, gone. But it does bring us to our next study, the lake of fire. Again, nobody's going to be like, whoa, I can't wait to hear you study this one. I, I hope nobody's like that. I mean, it's not that kind of study, I know. But again, we're going to read through this and break down everything that we come to as we get into this and understand what is that. Because it is the second death, and the Bible talks about the fact that it is not hell. It's not the same thing as the rich man and all those other things, so we'll break that in. So I'm going to read one last verse, and just kind of jumping forward, and I'm going to ask you a question at the end of this. Revelation 21, verse 4, and I know I'm jumping ahead, and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. You know why? It was cast. Neither sorrow nor crying, for there, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things are passed away. But the opening of that verse, he says, and God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And the question that I would ask you, why is he wiping away tears from their eyes? And the only thing, and I've heard this, that makes sense, the thing that happened right before that was seeing people cast into the lake of fire. Now I know some people say, I don't believe that we'll see that, but if from the beginning of Revelation all the way there, we are ruling and we are with Christ through all of that. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a mighty God. I... These are important because when we flip the page, we're going to get into heaven and the description of this new heaven and the new earth and all the things that Pastor Master began to explain. And he told me, he said, this is what we're going to do, Tony, when we were talking about both of us teaching this. He said, I'm going to do the flyover and then you're going to land and go through it. So we're, we're both doing it. So he gave you like the aerial view of it. And then we're going to go verse by verse through this. But this is important. So the next study that we're going to do is the lake of fire. It will not be next week. Um, we're going to, uh, we, we have Thanksgiving and all those kind of things. So no, no Bible studies, no Awana, no classes, nothing going on next Wednesday. Um, but then uh, we will the following Wednesday pick up on this and things. So questions being asked right now. I mean, there's a lot of things going on uh, with, you know, COVID and all these things. We're trying to be as cautious as possible. Um, we are, and so I challenge you guys, I mean, we're social distancing, uh, we, we, are, we are doing touch-free services and all those things, uh, but we are having service on Sunday. They will be the same services that we've had. Uh, we will have the service at 9.30. Uh, for those that are high risk, that's when we encourage people to wear masks, social distance, smaller group for those that are at high risk, and then we have the service at 11, and we'll be Facebook Live at that time as well. You say, why are you doing that? Because what we do is important. And I'm not saying that we wouldn't make changes according to like health and things. I'm not ruling those things out. But at the same time, we are trying to be faithful because what people need right now is they need the word of God. They need truth. Uh, we, we've done the different things in the, in the past of being able to adapt to those things. And if things get crazy or whatever, we'll make decisions as we go. Uh, but I hope that you're here Sunday. Let's be safe and be smart. And this coming Sunday is our Thanksgiving service. 
Uh, it is a worship service and preaching and, and prayer, and it's just a beautiful service for us to have to put our hearts and minds in the right place as we get into Thanksgiving. So let's pray, and uh, we'll be dismissed. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for the word of God. And Lord, as we read these verses, it's just a reminder of us with what you've saved us from. But Lord, I am also reminded for those that don't know this. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, for anybody that might be watching online or sitting in this room right now, that they've never come to a point in their life of understanding what you did and how to receive you. I pray, Lord, that you'll bring conviction to their heart and mind and, and just prick their heart, Lord, to, to reach out and, to, Lord, to get answers. Lord, these things were not given to us in the Bible just to scare us, Lord. They were given to us to help us to understand, Lord, that it would stir our hearts up, that we would have a burden to tell others, Lord, because of the fact is today we have hope. I thank you for that hope. Thank you, Lord, for the, the weeks that we're about to have with Thanksgiving and family, and I pray that you help us to Always remember the blessings and the goodness that you've given us through the Son. I thank you, Lord, for this Bible study. I pray, Lord, for those that are sick and not here, for those that are struggling. I pray, Lord, for Mrs. Denoff. I lift up Margaret Walker and, and Vance Higgins. And, Lord, the long list of those that we love so much that are going through so much trials and, and difficulties at this time. Be with us as we go our separate ways. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.